Good morning. I'm Gilbert Frankie. Um, most of you know me, but there might be a few who don't, because I noticed there are an awful lot of new members going to be observed at the new member dinner on the 25th, I guess, is last Sunday of the month, anyway, right? And one of the announcements is that that's a potluck meal in connection with the observance, uh, celebration of new members. So, um, are there any other announcements? I picked this up, but I haven't really looked. Um, so if anybody knows of an announcement that needs to be added, speak now or forever hold your peace, right? <laughs> All right. I guess then that um, we're ready to begin with the first hymn. Is that the way it goes? I have to check and <clears throat> make sure I am where I'm supposed to be here. Yes, please stand for the processional hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let Israel be glad in his Maker. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Let us now make confession of our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. Merciful Father, we confess our sinfulness. We are not worthy for you to come among us. We are indeed sinful from our birth, and since that time have transgressed against you in thought, word, and deed. Our actions have brought injury to others. We have left undone those things we ought to have done. We have done those things which we ought not to have done. We sincerely repent of our sins. Graciously hear this, our confession, O Lord, 
and grant us your grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ by the renewing work of the Holy Spirit within us. Lead us to amend our sinful lives that each day we may grow in righteousness and in hope in the glory of your holy name. Jesus, our Redeemer and God's greatest gift, promises forgiveness, life, and salvation, and welcomes us to his table. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You may be seated as we continue with the hymn of praise. The Old Testament reading today comes from Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, through chapter 6, verse 6. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will blind us. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring, spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as a light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle today comes from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the laws bring wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. 
That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that I do not exist. In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was good as dead, or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully conceived that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but, all, for, but for ours also. It will be continued to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, the uh, Gospel lesson is a text from a sermon this morning. It deals with Jesus' call of Matthew, the tax collector, to follow him and begin gathering sinners, and also with a confrontation from the Pharisees. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and other sinners? But when he heard it, he said, 
Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated, and the children can come up now for the children's message. And um, let's see, do the acolytes usually take care of the the uh, treasure box, and so I guess that's up to me now. Hmm, I don't know where there is a treasure box. Here it is. Okay. All right. Let's see what we can do here. Hmm. All right. How are you doing? Good. Okay. Now, I think Pastor Bershey usually gets down here on the floor, doesn't he? <laughs> and if I do that, one of you's going to have to help me up, I think. <laughs> but I'll try it. All right. Let's see what we got here. Hmm. I've got something here that I think is very pretty. You see that? I think it's pretty because I like to sail. And there's sailboats in there and a lighthouse. It's a candle. It hasn't been burned yet, but you can light it here. And when the fire gets down there, I'll bet it would be pretty. A lot of times when somebody has something really pretty and they show it to somebody else, the other person says, oh, that is so nice. I really like that. And in some countries, if you do that, you know what the person will say? Consider it yours. You may have it because you admired it. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? But that's what some people do in some countries. They admire something, and then the person says, consider it yours. Now, in what I read just a little while ago, we read that God did something like that for Abraham. When Abraham came to God and, and admired the promise that God gave him, he said, wow, what a promise that you'll give me righteousness if I believe in you. God said exactly that. He said, consider that righteousness yours. It's yours because you believed. Now, that doesn't necessarily make sense either, does it? We usually think, oh, you have to earn something. You have to work hard to get it. But God says, if you trust my promise, if you just believe that I sent Jesus to be your Savior, and he died for your sins and rose again, so that you could be with me forever. If you believe that, then consider it yours. It's yours. I give it to you. That's a great gift because none of us could work hard enough to be perfect in God's sight. But when God says, consider it yours because you trust my promise, he makes us his children. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your promise that when we trust it, you give us your righteousness. 
Keep us always as your children in faith and in our deeds. Amen. Okay. Well, what do y'all do with this? Mm, I don't usually have much to see this. I can't see it from the pew. Ah, it doesn't open. Oh, you can open it. Okay. There you go. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for my sermon is the gospel lesson appointed for today. And here we read, as I mentioned earlier, about Jesus calling Matthew from collecting taxes to gathering people, sinners. And we also hear about that confrontation with the Pharisees who couldn't understand why Jesus was eating with tax collectors, and other sinners. We have to put other sinners in there. It's not in the text. But they considered tax collectors to be pretty bad sinners. So we might just as well add that other sinners so we understand where they were coming from. Oh, let's see. Let's pray. Gracious God, you call the sick, the weak, the poor, the lame, the sorrowful, and sinners like ourselves, open the eyes of our hearts so that we see our own needs and respond to your gift of grace and love. Open the hands of our hearts that we respond generously to the needs of others. Amen. Attitude check. It was a few years ago, our boys, we had two boys, and they went to Camp Lone Star. So you can tell it's quite a few years ago. They were um, young boys then. Now our son's almost 50. So uh, they came back from camp, and I, found, I, I learned a new phrase, this attitude check. Uh, I found out that 
when, when a person is down and discouraged or when they're critical and not very kind, the counselors over at Camp Lone Star would say, attitude check, consider what you're doing, what you're saying, straighten up your attitude, attitude check. It's a pretty good phrase. We used it around the house for a while after that. And in our text here, Jesus called for an attitude check in our text. In fact, it's kind of like the fellow who was driving one of the, a car, when they first came out with those little dash lights, you know, that would warn you when something had to be looked at, and, and he saw that, whoa, check your engine, come on. He pulled over, stopped, opened the hood, and looked, said, yep, it's still there, <laughs> and he went on. Well, that's kind of what some people do with this attitude check, too. Attitude check. Yep, I've still got one. And so they go on. That's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about, check your attitude with these words. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Those words call us to an attitude check as well. Check your attitude. See if you're one who considers yourself righteous and don't need a savior. Or check and see if you're one who recognizes your need of a savior. I think that's one reason why Dr. Martin Luther said, when we consider our sins, we should, or when we consider our lives, we should go through the commandments and think about each commandment and how we've done in keeping up the commandments. That's an attitude check. That's the way we find out, oh my, we are in need of a lot more than we could possibly do to make things right. Well, in the text, Matthew was ready to receive. Matthew was ready to receive what Jesus had. He was one who knew that he was uh, a sinner because everybody told him he was a sinner. And here, maybe we need a little bit of an explanation. We talked about it in Bible class this morning. Um, you know, When you hear somebody telling you something over and over again, pretty soon you start believing it, or at least recognizing it, right? At least recognizing it. And being a tax collector in Jesus' day was not just a description of a profession. Being called a tax collector then was a moral description because people back then, in the, under the, the power of the Roman government, would bid on this job of being a tax collector. They would bid without any pay. They would take the job to collect taxes from their fellow citizens. In this case, Jews. Matthew was a Jew, and he bid on the job to be a tax collector, he got the job, and he was collecting money for Rome from his fellow Jews there in, Jerusalem, in, in Capernaum. Well, how did he make his living? <laughs> he collected a little more than Rome wanted, and he put the rest in his pocket. So it was a pretty lucrative business. As much as you could collect, you only sent the amount needed in, and the rest went in your pocket. And you can imagine how his neighbors felt about that. Tax collectors. Tax collectors. Why is Jesus eating with this tax collectors and others like him? Yeah. Well, Matthew understood that he needed something. He was... He was a sinner. He couldn't stand before God like the 
tax collector in the temple who stood there and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the way Matthew felt. So he was ready to receive. And when Jesus said, come, follow me, he went willingly, eagerly, to see what Jesus had to give him. The Pharisees, on the other hand, didn't know that they had a need. They were pretty self-righteous. People told them that. People were always telling them how good they looked and what they were doing was great, that they were keeping all the commandments. They, they, would, they would tithe everything they had and, and everything they made, they'd give a tithe a tenth of. They kept all the law. They were, they were righteous. Uh, they were self-righteous. So they, they thought they were in pretty good shape. They didn't realize that they needed anything. They were like the ancestors, their ancestors in Hosea's day. We read about it in the Old we, we heard about it in the Old Testament. I didn't read it. <laughs> we heard about it in the Old Testament. Thank you so very much for that reading. You see, God said to his people, turn back to me. Seek my face. Repent of your sins. And the people of Hosea's day said, yeah, we can do that. We'll go back to God because, after all, he likes to forgive. I used this phrase in Bible class this morning. God likes to forgive, and, and we like to sin. That's a pretty good arrangement. Huh. That's pretty much what they said. They said, we'll go back to God. He's torn us down, but he'll bind us up. He's, he's weakened us, destroyed us, but he'll pick us up. We'll survive because that's the way God is. And you can always count on his mercy. It's like the, the spring rains, you know. Every spring it rains and the crops grow. That's the way it works, like the sun in the morning. Or the old saying about, it always rains after a drought, right? <laughs> it always rains after a drought. That's pretty much the way they looked at Jesus, at God's mercy. He'll take care of us because that's the way he is. God recognized their motivation, their attitude. And God said, and you, my people, are like the cloud that comes up in the morning and by mid midday it's gone. You're like the dew on the grass. It doesn't last very long and it's gone. My first congregation was up in Harold, Texas. And, and Harold, Texas is pretty dry. There's not much humidity up there. And people were always wanting rain. To give you an idea of that, uh, when we moved to the other side of Brenham, uh, people started talking about, we need rain, we need rain. And, and Beth said, what are they talking about? It rained three weeks ago. That's what we were used to up in Harold, right? <laughs> Winds that blew all the time and rains that you ever, hardly ever saw. And I said one time something about, well, at least we've got some dew on the grass this morning. And one of the farmers said, you know where that dew comes from? It comes out of the ground and we need it in the ground. I just didn't understand. But that's the way the people of Hosea's day felt about the dew. I mean, the way God told them about the dew. It's there in the morning and then it's gone. It doesn't do any good. And that's the way your promises of repentance are. That's the way the Pharisees were too. They didn't really get it. They thought they didn't need any help. So Jesus is calling for an attitude change. But when he said, I came to call sinners, not the righteous, sick people are the ones that need doctors, they translated it like this. Oh, you don't need me because you're so righteous. It's just the sick people who need doctors. They just didn't understand. So, well, let's see. Perhaps one Pharisee did get it. Perhaps one Pharisee 
received a new attitude in his life, and that would be Jairus. Just after our text, a ruler of the synagogue, probably a Pharisee, came to Jesus and he said, Master, my daughter has just died. Come with me. Come with me and put your hand on her. Now there was a man who knew his need. His daughter had died and he couldn't do anything about it. He was absolutely helpless. So he came to Jesus in his need, and he said, come, help me. Take care of this need. Help my daughter. He didn't know quite what to expect, but he was, he was hoping. And he knew his need for sure. It changed his attitude. He changed him from being a self-righteous person to being someone who was on his knees for help. And as a matter of fact, Jesus changes attitudes. He changes our attitudes. He helps us to understand our needs. Uh, Jesus finds us in our need. He comes to us in our need, and our needs bring us to our knees before the cross. Because when we recognize our sinfulness before God, there's nothing we can do about it but fall on our knees and seek his forgiveness. That's the change in our attitude because Jesus finds us in our deepest need. He finds us when we really need him. Jesus promised, I came to call sinners, not the righteous, is his promise that when you are hurting, when you have losses in your life, when, when, when you're facing a catastrophic illness or a fatal illness, when, when those around you are hurting, that's his promise that he will find you in your need. I came to call sinners, not righteous. Those who are sick need a physician, and Jesus promises to come be with us in our ailments. When we're self-satisfied, however, we don't recognize God's promise. When we're self-satisfied and self-righteous, we think everything is fine. Everything's going great. Who needs a savior? Who needs a physician? Who needs a friend? We're doing great. Once I knew someone who was living a, through a really difficult time in his life. Hard time. Family was broken up. He didn't know where to turn next. And his neighbor was just beside himself with how can that person, how can you act that way? How can you do that? My goodness, that's just terrible. He was rather self-righteous about it, as a matter of fact. Probably wasn't a very nice thing to say, but someone said, what that neighbor of yours needs is a really messy divorce. And then they might be able to empathize with you. Sometimes it's our needs that help us see our, our, our Savior. And God uses those needs in our lives to come to us and pick us up. Wouldn't wish a messy divorce on anyone. But it is through our needs, whatever they may be, that God brings us to our knees before his throne of mercy, and that God comes to us in our needs to strengthen, to forgive, to support, and be there with us. You know, it's really a blessing to know what you need. 
A friend of mine one time had a crick in his back. It was really bothering him. And he finally decided, you know, I've never gone to a chiropractor before in my life, but people tell me maybe it'll help. I'm going to go to a chiropractor. So he finally went, and the chiropractor said, well, before I can do any adjustments, I need to take a full x-ray to see what we're working with. Oh, I don't need an x-ray. Just pop my back. The chiropractor said, no, that's policy. So he took a picture, an x-ray, and he found an aortal aneurysm which could burst at any time and be fatal. It was a real blessing for that man to find out what he needed. And so he went to the hospital and, and they put a mesh around that aneurysm and he survived. He did, he did well. He, he got the chiropractic adjustment too. But the main thing was finding what he needed. That was a blessing. And that's where God brings blessings to us, too. When we go through the commandments and evaluate our lives, and we see, you shall have no other God before me. And we say, oh my, there have been some times when I haven't kept God in first place. You shall not take my name in vain. Oh, there have been a lot of times when I said a lot more than OMG. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Be in touch with my word on Sunday and every day of your life because that's where the power is, in my word. And you need to hear the promise. And so on down all the commandments. Honor your father and mother. So forth and so on. When we go through like that, then we recognize our needs and that's a blessing to us because in Luther's coat of arms, the cross imposed upon the, the heart is a reminder of our sin that was made right in Jesus' death on the cross. And God's grace that turned our heart into a heart born anew. Recognizing our need is a blessing because it changes our attitude. It gives us an awareness of what we need and we can come to Jesus ready to receive, like Matthew. When we need a new attitude that recognizes our need and responds to God's gift of love, that puts the cross of Christ in our heart that cleanses our heart by his forgiveness, that robe of righteousness that we sang about, a robe of righteousness that God considers ours because we trust his promise. And then we are his, not just in this life, but for all eternity in the life to come. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
As dear children ask their dear father, let us bring to the Lord our prayers this day, knowing that he will hear us and respond to our petitions and our needs. Confidently we come to our Father in heaven. Lord, in your mercy. As citizens of our blessed land, we pray for the world in which we live and for the leaders of every nation, as well as our own, that peace may prevail around the globe and that we may live without fear in our times. Lord, in your mercy. In this season of growth, we pray for the church, that it may grow and flourish even in those places where persecution for our Lord's sake is known. Grant that there be unhindered access to the table of the Lord in every land. Lord, in your mercy. Gathered in heart and mind, we pray for those in need of our special petitions, including our shut-ins, those unable to be present in worship today, Joyce Meyer, and George Beatty, and Carrie Steinbach. We include those dealing with cancer and cancer treatments. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Brenda, Carolyn, and Lisa. Lymphoma, James. Lung cancer, Stephanie and Kathleen and Patsy. A brain tumor, Robert, Kelly, Dylan, and Linnea. Breast cancer, Darlene, Shirley, and Trish. Leukemia, Bennett. Liver cancer, Wayne, Matt. Pancreatic cancer, Alan. Other cancers, Shannon and Josh and Johnny. Howard, Gary, Janet, Carol, Doyle, Eva, Mac, Kim, David, Sylvia, Cindy, Nell, and Gloria, and Rob, and Sherry. We also remember those with illness and health issues. We remember those recovering from surgery, Tori and Tracy and Bradley and Becky, Loretta and Donna, Susie and Lisa. Those with other health issues, Joyce and Dale, Kim, Megan, Chris, Mary, Dolores, Sandra and Greg. Recovering from a stroke, Vernell and Jennifer, Anita, Caitlin, Ron, those needing protection, Zach, serving with the Texas National Guard at the border, Margie with broken leg, Shani with a liver, trans, a liver disease, looking for a transplant, and other prayers of healing for Johnny and Mark, Gloria and Ella, Mary Ann, Ruby, Ophelia, Bob, Paulette, Sarah, Ashley, and Kimbra. And others too, O Lord, that you know and whose concerns we bear in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, with thankfulness we remember those whose earthly lives have been completed, including relatives, friends, and members of this household of faith, and so many others. Grant that we may be blessed by the memory of all who have fallen asleep in Jesus, as in blessed hope we await the resurrection to life eternal and the final invitation to the banquet in God's kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, gathered in the forgiving love of Christ and assured that our Heavenly Father hears our petitions, we say with hopeful hearts and voices, Amen. Remember us in your kingdom, O Lord, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 